Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that uh, this morning, again, we can look into your word under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that you will bless us and you will lift Jesus Christ up before us in his name. Amen. Genesis 25 starts with the words, Abraham again. Abraham again what? Well, Abraham again took a wife. Now that sounds weird, right? Abraham again took a wife. So you would ask somebody around the age of 140, what does he want? Because that was his age, roughly. His wife died at 127 when Abraham was 137. Now his son Isaac is married. So the good old guy says, let me get married. So Abraham again took a wife. That is the reason why it's emphasized that again he took a wife. Go with me back to chapter 12. Actually, chapter 11, verse 20. Nine, then Abram and Nahor, who's Nahor? His brother. Then Abram and Nahor did what? Took wives. So each one took a wife. Then in chapter 25, we are told Abraham again took a wife. Why is it emphasized? Because of this. Took a wife here and took a wife here. And here is the famous God remembered. Right? All right, but were Sarah and Keturah Abraham's only wives? Because from the Bible we know Abraham married Sarai and they had how many sons? One, Isaac. But before Isaac was born, because Isaac is not the firstborn, even though Abraham, following God's instructions, has to treat him as if he were the firstborn, Abraham also has a child with Hagar, Ishmael. Uh, was Hagar a wife? Well, let's read verse 1 in chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, that is to Abraham. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to his husband, Abram, to be 
his, his wife. Strange, isn't it? But watch this. So, Abram has his first wife, the primary wife, Sarah. Then, he gets that complementary wife from Sarah. But at one point, Sarah wants Hagar to leave. So, can we say Abraham divorced? You cannot. He sent Hagar away. And even God agreed. Look at chapter 21. But God said to Abraham, verse 12, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. In other words, send her away. Even if there was no formal divorce in those days, obviously, separation happened here. <laughs> Would you expect that to happen to Abraham from a wife? Then you have, when Abraham is how old? Roughly 140, he marries Keturah. But let's read the text. Back to 25. Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bore him, and now the six names of her sons are listed. One of them being Midian. Midian. That's the tribe where Moses will get his wife, Zipporah, from later. Then jump to verse 5. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. So now we are even more confused. Because we've seen from the text that Sarah is a wife, the primary, the first wife. Then Hagar is called wife. And then Keturah is wife as well. There is a separation or divorce here. So, when Sarah dies, when Abraham is 137, it seems that Hagar had not come back because he needs a wife. So, he remarries and he takes Keturah. But jump with me to 1 Chronicles Chapter 1. And look at verse 32. Now the sons born to Keturah, Abraham's what? Concubine. So Keturah is called a concubine as well. Now why? Well, probably because there is a process. If the description in chapter 16 is chronological, then Abraham first heeded the voice of Sarai, 
please go into my maid. So Abraham first had intercourse with Hagar. And then verse 3 says that Sarai gave her to him as a wife. So first she's a concubine, then she becomes a wife. By the same kind of process, when Abraham takes Keturah as a wife, it is possible, some say, that Keturah had already been a concubine before. So now since Sarah has died, he elevates Keturah from the status of a concubine to the status of a wife. We have no certainty on that. We are just putting together the biblical data. Fact is that with this woman, Abraham, that is 140 roughly around that time, has six sons. Should we believe that starting at 140 up to 175, he had six more sons with Keturah. I see some of the young men frown to it. Again, we don't know. What I'm pointing out is that Abraham had a pretty complicated life. Not only him, I suppose Sarah, Hagar, and Keturah did not have an easy life either. So now with all these complications in mind, let's go to chapter 25. In chapter 25, we have three kind of offsprings coming from Abraham. We have Keturah's offspring. This one. We have Hagar's offspring, and we have Sarah's offspring. The first section in chapter 25 focuses on uh, the offspring of Abraham through or by Keturah. It's interesting to see the construction, you have it on your worksheet, that the little chiasm focuses on the names of uh, the six sons and grandsons then. I'm not going to go through those names because uh, my language knowledge can have some difficulties just pronouncing those names. But it's a beautiful little construction pointing out that um, Abraham had six more sons coming through Keturah. Then, we have a little construction of Abraham's death and burial, where the emphasis is on the fact that he died 175, that is verse 7. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years. Watch now, verse 8. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and, what's the word there? Full of, your translation may supply the word years. There is no years there. He was an old man and full. Period. So the emphasis of that fullness is not only on the time period he lived. Hey, he had a long. Somebody can live a long life and die empty. What the text says is that yes, he lived a long life, and in spite of the long life, he was full. 
I think that's something beautiful there. And he was gathered to his people, meaning he was buried where some other folks were buried. Now, I need you to go one step back and look at verses 5 and 6. And Abram gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts, so this is before he died. Why am I emphasizing this? Because there's this concept that my children are going to inherit my goods after I die. That's modern society. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east, which is Arabia, roughly, the Arabian Peninsula. So one very important principle, if I may call it like that here, is that you want to put your house in order before you leave. Abraham, knowing all the complications of his family, wasn't an easy situation to handle. Because God gave him the instructions, specific instructions regarding Isaac, that Isaac was going to inherit the covenant, the covenantal blessings. He designates Isaac as his main heir. Everything that he has will go to Isaac. But he makes sure this guy here, Ishmael, and this six guys here will also get their fair share. The way it puts it, they received gifts. It was like, okay, let me give you your portion, and now you guys are good to go. Go east. Leave this guy alone. He wanted to avoid family feud. Was that a success? We don't know too much. What we know, however, is that when Abraham dies, verse 9, look at verse 9, 25 verse 9, and his son Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, so we know at the death and burial of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael, because that's where the difficulty really was. Because Ishmael was the firstborn, Isaac was the second, so things were flipped around. But at that time, they are still together. They buried their father together. But we know from history, the relationship between Isaac's descendants and Ishmael's descendants were not easy. They were rough, rough relationship to this day, actually, right? So after Abraham is buried, verse 11, it's emphasized again. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. So Isaac is reinforced as the one that continues the genealogy of Abraham and the blessings of the covenant. And then we have the offspring of Abraham by Sarah. We have a nice little chiasm in there of uh, Ishmael's seed, the 12 tribes coming from Ishmael, verses 13 through 15. Then there's a little structure there that emphasizes Ishmael's lifespan. 137 years. So Ishmael lived... 137 years, Abraham was 137, 
when his wife, Sarah, died, and after that he got remarried to Keturah, or elevated Keturah to the level of a wife. So you can see how longer, how much longer Abraham lived, 175 compared to Ishmael. So the lifespan is shrinking. But remember, before the flood, we had 800, 900, so uh, we are way down at this point. But Abraham still lived a long life, long and complicated. Then in Genesis 25, verse 18, we have emphasized the place where Ishmael was going to dwell. And it seems that there's a little prophetic insight in that because it says he died in the presence of all his brethren. That's my NKJ translation. But the NIV says something slightly different or even significantly different because the text is very difficult to translate there. It seems that the text says that it fell, or the portion where Ishmael was going to live, fell against the face of all his brethren. Somehow pointing out the animosity, the enmity, the hostility between Ishmael and uh, his brethren. Then we have the story of Isaac praying for Rebekah. Starting uh, with Genesis uh, 25, around 20. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife. Verse 19, this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Isaac was 40 years old. Now, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Again, we've seen this before, right? Sarah was in a similar situation. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Verse 22 but the children struggled together within her. You know, the womb mates were kicking one another. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? That's her question. We don't know if up to this point anybody else had twins. But... At this point, we have a young lady, much younger than Isaac, experiencing this soccer game of uh, the twins, the womb mates in her belly. If all is well, so she thought something is wrong, something was wrong. Why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Again, we get to know that they really were interested in what the Lord had to say. So she inquires of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, two peoples shall be separated from your body, one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. That's a prophetic message. So now Rebecca knows that the younger will somehow be treated as if he were the older. Have we seen this before? Isaac was younger than Ishmael, and the order was flipped there as well. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there was twins, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Harry. 
Esau, that's what it means, Harry. So they called his name Esau, it means Harry, Harry. Afterward, his brother came out and his name took hold of Esau's and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Jacob means heel, but it also means to follow or even to supplant. So the boys grew. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. That's an important observation. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. What is translated here with mild in Hebrew is complete. And it's used in biblical language when somebody has this, this fulfilled kind of attitude, when you feel complete. Esau seems to be the agitated guy. He has to go and hunt. Jacob is all right. He's complete at home with mom around the household. Now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And then the story goes on with how Jacob tricked Esau to sell him his birthright, the firstborn right. The firstborn in those days has some rights and some responsibilities. I avoid the word privileges. Some people would say, yeah, firstborn had privileges. Privilege is when you are given something, but nothing really is expected additionally from you. A firstborn had extra rights and extra responsibilities. You know the story of uh, Elisha and Elijah. When Elijah was about to leave, his disciple Elisha told him, Master, I would like to receive a double portion of your spirit. What are you asking for? Sometimes I hear that expression in prayers, people asking for a double portion of the Spirit. But few people understand what that means in that historical context. Elisha is asking Elijah, actually, to be his inheritor, his heir, to be the one that carries on his ministry, to be his spiritual firstborn, that will be given his office of prophet and he will be able to carry it on. So, little by little, we get to the end of uh, chapter 25 and we see three marriages, three different kinds of offspring, an old guy, 140, getting remarried, somebody that had a separation, divorce from one of his wives. A complicated life. You know, there is this saying that uh, life has seven stages. There is a spill stage, and then there is a drill stage, and there is a thrill stage, and then there is a bill stage, and then an ill stage, and then the pill stage, and then the will stage. I wonder where Abraham was at all these moments of his life. Because none of us really have an idea what it means to be at 140 ready to remarry. And we don't know really what it entails to deal with all those complications in that specific historical context. 
What we can see, however, is that in spite of the challenges of life, Abraham stays faithful to the Lord. He tries to do his best in less than perfect circumstances. And as his followers or his spiritual children, we are to do the same. Trust the Lord. He trusted the Lord and that was accounted to him as righteousness. Questions? Did Abraham ask God if it was okay for him to have concubines? From the story in chapter 16, when Sarai gives Abraham, well, a complimentary wife. It's not a permission, it's an order. It's different. It's not Sarah telling Abraham, you know, sweetheart, if you want, because we don't have a child, you can do this. I know how much you want to have an heir, a biological offspring. That's not what happens there. Sarah tells him what to do and gives him what she gives him. In the text, we don't have anything that indicates that Abraham inquired God's will on that. If you go to chapter 17, which is right after, it's when God comes and reconfirms the covenant that was cut in chapter 15, you know, with the animals. In chapter 17, God comes back to Abraham, and that's when Abraham kind of pleads with God to accept Ishmael as his heir. And God says, mm -mm, no, I will treat him well, I will take care of him, but I will not change the plan with regard to his story, to the future of the plan of salvation, the genealogy of the Messiah. No, no. I'm going to take care of Ishmael. I'll bless him. He will be a big nation as well. But you will have a son from Sarah. So again, in the text, we don't know anything about Abraham inquiring with regard to the concubine. Plus, as I pointed out earlier, in the text it is plainly said that actually Sarai gave Hagar to Abram to be his wife. So it was sort of a concubine wife, maybe in stages. First, a concubine. The text allows that interpretation if it's strictly chronological. First, she was given as a concubine, then she was ratified by Sarai as a wife. But when we jump to Keturah, the story of uh, Genesis 25 starts with the fact that Keturah indeed was a wife. Abraham again took a wife. But then a few verses down, we are told about the sons of the concubines, plural. And in the context, that means that both Keturah and Hagar are called concubines. And then we have the confirmation in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 32, that indeed Keturah is called concubine. That's why the question is asked, so was she first a concubine? And then when Sarah passed away, she was ratified as a wife. Again, in the story, we have nothing that indicates how Abraham dealt with this in his conversations with God. But absence of evidence is no evidence of absence. So the right answer is we don't know. What we know, however, is that it was the culture of the time it was a big thing in those days. And even later on, look at David, look at Solomon. For a man to have both wives, 
plural, and concubines, plural. So it's, it's a very complicated society. Very good question. How do you handle a situation today when somebody can't have children, like husband and wife can't have children, and they would uh, ask for the services of a surrogate mother. And the answer to that, as you may expect, is, I don't know. <laughs> what I know from the Bible is that, ideally, it's Adam and Eve. Then, if I jump straight to the New Testament, I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that each man should have his wife singular, and each wife should have her husband singular. So, just like in the time of Abraham, I have nothing specified in the text that God was happy about concubines and complications, because what Abraham did at that time, it was uh, running ahead and uh, accepting Sarah to dictate or to set the plan for him instead of allowing God to fulfill his plans. Because here's the question. What is the problem if a man and a wife a husband and a wife can't have children, biological children. Is that a problem? Is that a no-no? Is that some sort of a curse? Don't we have stories in which people simply didn't have children? And don't we have stories in which people were told they can't have children and then they had children without going for any, anything else. Now, another complicated question can be, how do we deal with the scientific kind of interventions that can happen today, fertilization? I have no proof in the Bible that fertilization from a different way or means than the natural means happened in those days. So we are dealing with some ethical things where it's very hard to say this or that. I know some people know everything and they will tell you exactly what to do and how to do it and there's no doubt, no uh, question mark. I don't believe in that kind of Christianity. I believe that the Bible gives us guidelines and I think it is extremely risky to run ahead of God and start doing things that God has not told you to do and has never ratified to do. And there are aspects in which it's hard to find a clear answer from the Bible. Whether the right fertilization is just the one that happens in a natural way or you can appeal to the help of some extra people, not sexually, in the process of uh, fertilization. Tricky, tricky questions. That's a, that's a very interesting observation. Let me reread the text. So, based on verse 2 in chapter 17, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly, says God, to Abraham. So can we infer from there that, okay, God promised, so then he provided for Abraham multiple marriages so that it can be fulfilled. Now, God never says this will happen in the first generation to Abraham. All that biologically Abraham needed for this promise of God to be fulfilled was one offspring. One. Because you know that in the second generation, when uh, from Isaac you already have two, 
Even there, only one goes on with that lineage. Only one. Then you have the next generation. From Jacob, you have 12 tribes. But from the 12 tribes, how many carry on the lineage to the Messiah? One. Which one? Judah. Is Judah the firstborn? Who's the firstborn? Reuben. Reuben. So again, the order is flipped. But you can go on and at one point you reach David, King David. And then from King David goes on, but always there's one, 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 one going on. Well, actually, from King David on, there are two lines, one going down to Maria or Mary or Miriam. And the other one going down to Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus. And there are some reasons why. But what I'm trying to emphasize is the promise of God about multiplication and uh, many nations is not affected in any way if in the first generation he only had one offspring. Because in the end, the fulfillment of all this promise is completed with Jesus Christ when in Jesus Christ the ethnic kind of uh, Israel is stretched out to bring in all the nations. So at this point, we can say that Abraham's promise, God's promise to Abraham is fulfilled because of how the New Testament presents the new Israel, the new kind of Israel in which all the nations or people from among all the nations are grafted in. And now this is the multi-ethnic, multicultural Israel, right? So no problem with the fulfillment of the promise. But does it go a little bit against uh, the, the guts of a human being when you are promised, hey, uh, you are going to be a big nation and then uh, you are 100 and have no children? And remember, Sarah, before she conceives at 90, she says, I'm old. So she wasn't young. And she says, and my husband isn't young either. So that's why I was asking, okay, so could he have six more children after 140? Or Keturah had been already a concubine, which I don't know. Thank you for the question. Yes. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. So in chapter 25, let me go back and uh, reread it. But the children struggle together within her, okay, the womb mates. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? Or why this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. We don't know what she inquired. We know, however, what the Lord answered. If it's allowed to infer from the answer what the question may have been, so going back from the answer to see what the question may have been, this is the answer. Two nations are in your womb. So probably the question was, hey, what is this kind of fight, this soccer game that is happening in my belly? Right? Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. Okay, so the Lord explains to her, I don't know exactly how, in a dream or just speaking to her like that. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So that's why the fight is happening. So we don't know exactly, but from the answer, we can approximate that the, the question was regarding, hey, what is going on here? <laughs> Having kids at 40. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Not 40, actually, because according to 
Genesis 25 and 26, Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. That doesn't mean they waited until 60 because they didn't want to have children earlier because they had to do their studies and they wanted to do a business and they wanted to invest their money first and then... <sighs> That's not the story. The story says they wanted to have children, so Isaac got married at 40. Rebecca was much younger. We don't know exactly how much younger. Tradition says she was a teenager. But obviously... Here uh, we have a 60-year-old when the first children appear because they wanted children, but she couldn't conceive. So how does that apply to our society? It is not specified in the Bible what is the age when somebody should have children or should start having children. Although the psalm says that um, the children born at a young age are a blessing, but the Bible doesn't say when it should start and uh, when somebody becomes too old to have children. What I see in many lives of God's children is those exceptional situations. But in spite of the challenges of uh, mishaps, of uh, natural or biological inabilities, God still was able to carry out miracles around the event of childbirth. <laughs> Correct, let me repeat briefly what you are saying. So the whole story of the Old Testament, all the little stories in the story are object lessons or types, typology, typos, that's the Greek word in the New Testament, of what was going to happen with Jesus Christ, with the coming of Jesus Christ. And although God cared about every nation, God showed a special attention to this people of Israel because it was the genealogy through which the Messiah was going to be uh, brought in. And uh, yes, that is obvious in everything that happens in these Abrahamic and then Isaac story. And remember, with so many exceptional, extraordinary births, back in the type, you have then an exceptional, extraordinary birth in the anti-type. Because the way Jesus is born is not ordinary either. So it's like preparing the territory and the mindset for something like that to happen. Yes, good question. So, if you search for Abraham's name on the internet, you will be given the impression that people believe he was the first Jewish person. Now, etymologically, Jew, Jewish, comes from Jude rather than from Abraham. But Abraham is the Hebrew. Because if you look in the genealogy in Genesis 11, verse 17, 16 and 17, Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. Now this Eber is the name from which Heber, Heber, Hebrew, come. So Abraham coming from that genealogy and being the one that God called from Ur to come and live in Canaan and from him God was going to start blessing all the nations. That's why many people associate Abraham with a Jew. But Jew, Jewish is a later development because first you have 
Hebrew, Heber, Eber. Then you have Israel or Israel. And only later, as a later development, you have Jew, Jewish. Because those that were living in the territory given to Abraham in the time of Jesus Christ, when Jesus was born and he lived on the earth, most of them were from the tribe of Judah, Jude. Judah, some Levites, and the little tribe of Benjamin. Those were the people that came back from the exile from Babylon. The rest of the tribes, of the 12 tribes, they were dispersed. Very few, very few of them went back to the territory of uh, Israel. So that's why in the New Testament, we don't have too much mentioning about Israel. We have mentioning about the Jews. Jewish. Because at that time, that's who they are. But Jesus came from Jude or Judah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your guidance in our study. May the Holy Spirit continue to deepen our understanding in Jesus' name. Amen.